We'd like to welcome you to the fourth annual Authors and Artists Festival, Rewilding. Uh, my name is Paul Richmond. Uh, this is, uh, I represent Human Air Publishing, one of the groups who was a sponsor and working here. This is our second day. Uh, make sure that after you come back or check out all the other videos that will be up for there's three tracks going on both days and there's lots of things, speakers, panelists, poets speaking. Um, tell your friends about it. So if you missed it during this weekend, there'll be many chances for you to check out and see what's going on. We have a great first uh, presentation. We're going to get right into it so they have enough time. I'm going to rep uh, introduce uh, Noah, who's going to have a presentation on uh, Trees Tell Us a Story. Thank you so much all about uh, my book, uh, These Trees Tell a Story, for the next half hour or so. Uh, and let me just jump right in. And I, I want to start with a story um, in uh, Nashville, Tennessee, where I grew up. Uh, for the last 15 years or so, I've run this uh, nonprofit and we, where we're trying to conserve landscapes there. And Nashville uh, is one of the largest land area cities within the country. It's got, I think it's over uh, about 250 square miles of closed canopy forest within its metro area. And, uh, you know, we've mapped out these areas that are core conservation uh, targets. And this is the official open space plan that's officially adopted by the Metro Council. And we mapped out the core areas and the, co the corridors linking between them. And I want to zoom in on the Richland Creek corridor right here. Uh, and this is Richland Creek. And this right here is what I call the Nito Bridgeway. Um, and when I was a kid, my mom used to pick me up from school and drive me home down this road here. And we would uh, drive over this railroad here. Now, you used to be able to drive across here, uh, across the railroad, but you see the road no longer connects there. But when I was a kid, we used to be able to drive across and we'd get to the bridge and she'd stop the car and I'd get out and she'd ask me to count how many turtles I could see from the bridge. And I'd look over the edge and sometimes I'd see dozens of turtles, different species, map turtles, uh, uh, soft shelled turtles, box turtles, snapping turtles. Uh, turtles that today are on the list of the species of greatest need of conservation within the state. They're also green herons, blue herons, just, uh, just one of my favorite wildlife viewing spots ever. So a few years ago, I went uh, to take my kids back and, and, and uh, experience this sacred part of my childhood. So we get to the road and we find this. And I'm like, wait, what do you mean road closed? This is a public road. What do you mean I can't go there? And I did a little bit of digging, and it turns out the year before, uh, the city of Nashville had literally given this road away to the two abutting landowners uh, for free. Um, and this went through uh, five different committees, three different readings of council, and this was a two-stage process, so this played out over two years, all of this stuff, uh, separately, twice. Um, and apparently nowhere along the way did anybody raise their hand and, and be like, wait a minute, this isn't a good idea. You know, conservationists are fighting tooth and nail for spaces like this, and we have one, and we're just going to give it away. And, you know, the people making these decisions are fine, well-intentioned people. Some of them are actually on the board of our nonprofit. They're, they're great people. But they're given maps that look like this. Black and white plat maps that sort of show the parcel boundaries and the traffic flow. And um, remember how I said this end of the road is a dead-end road now? So it no longer has any traffic value. So, yeah, there's no value in that road. Give it away. Why not? Um, obviously what's not mapped here are the conservation values, the ecological context, the, the sort of environmental flows around uh, each of these parcels. So this is uh, what I'm really uh, uh, passionate about, having decision makers and, and everybody sort of be aware, more aware of the ecological context around us. When I was writing this book, you know, I did a lot of traveling and, and I went to my friend John's farm down in Tennessee and he's a great naturalist and he has this uh, land um, where he's got all these farms that he's managing with uh, prescribed burns and all sorts of stuff. And we were walking along his land. I was pushing my kids in the double stroller along these sort of farm roads, dirt roads, and we went down to the creek with raccoon tracks. And we were checking, he had all these wildlife cameras up. And we get up to the edge here where there's like this edge between the forest and the field. And uh, he's actually way up ahead of me. I'm like back behind with the double stroller. And and uh, he's standing at this trail intersection in the middle of these, these big sort of roads and in like dirt roads in the middle, looking down. And he's, he calls back to me, hey, hey, Noah, there's there's a scat here. I want you to look at, you know, because he knows that I have a thing for poop. And uh, he's like, I, I think it's a raccoon scat because he had like actually taken a picture of it the day before. He'd seen it and he brought it back and looked at Google Images and it kind of looked like a raccoon scat. And, you know, I'm back there behind the double stroller and I, I can't see it. It's like way up there. But but I know it's not a raccoon scat. You know, 
when you go to identify a scat, you don't start by looking at it. You, Sue Morse has this saying that she's a tracker and, and the, what she says is that half of tracking is knowing where to look, the other half is looking there. Nowhere in that is sort of what does the thing look like? When you wanna identify a scat, you start by looking at the context. Where is it? In the middle of this trail, in the trail intersection by the edge of the forest in a field, that's not where a raccoon would put its scat. Sure, a raccoon may have walked there, and, but she would put her scat down by the river on the uphill side of a hemlock or something. Right there in the middle of that trail, that's the place that a coyote is going to put its scat. And sure, it was kind of a funny scat from a coyote with a bunch of apples in it and stuff, but yeah, that's that's what it was. You got to start by looking at the ecological context. When I was doing my dissertation work uh, in the Berkshires, I went to you know something like five or 600 vernal pools all over the Berkshires, and I saw a lot of cool things. Uh, you know, crazy sculpture gardens of rich New Yorkers, summer homes, and and uh, cool ponds that I just really loved these places. But the whole time I was going to like 10 ponds a day, I was following my GPS to every one of those ponds, uh, driving with looking at my GPS, you know, going, walking through the landscape, sort of letting it tell me where to go. And I never did the work of like thinking about and creating the map in my head of like how to get from one place to the other. I let the GPS tell me all that stuff. So when I go back there now, I don't really have a map in my head of where these things are relative to each other. It's just kind of all a jumble. And I, I turn the corner driving my car and I see, oh, that sculpture. Oh, that's next to that pond. I didn't know they were next to each other. Cause because I never I never learned the space of the Berkshires. You know, these days with uh artificial intelligence and, and you know seek identifying species for us and chat GPT answering questions and writing papers for us, it's it's really powerful, cool, fun, useful technology. It's also a little bit terrifying to me. You know, when we no longer do that work of learning the species ourselves and we let the machines identify things for us and do the thinking for us, we kind of lose a bit of that process and we lose that connection and we lose some knowledge and information about the world around us. My favorite job I ever had was teaching this course where I would take students out into the nature uh, once a week on Fridays for the full day. We'd get in the mystery van, the mystery machine, and drive out, and uh, and uh, I'd take them to a puzzle, to a mystery, something on the landscape that you know they needed to solve, figure out what happened here, and they would spend the day reading the landscape, unpacking that mystery, looking at the pattern, and trying to describe what process caused it. And it was a really powerful experience for them and for me. Um, and so what do I mean when I say read the landscape? So for example, when you look in our backyard, you see hemlocks all throughout the understory, but no hemlocks in the canopy. And this is a pattern that tells a story. And I'll get back to that story in a second. I'm gonna give you another pattern. If you dig a hole anywhere in our yard, it just keeps going through this nice soft soil as far as you can reach. You know, our garden loves the soil and we dig through it, but you don't find any rocks. There are no rocks in our yard. But if you take a walk up the hill behind our house, within about 20 seconds, you start passing lots and lots of rocks. There are rocks everywhere. You can't avoid rocks. They're the footprints of the glaciers. That's why, you know, 200 years ago, the farmers had to haul them out of their fields and line their, their, their fields with these stone walls. So why aren't there rocks in our yard? Well, when the glaciers melted in our regions, um, it left behind this, this uh, glacial lake. And our house must have been below lake level, where for thousands of years, layer after layer of lake bottom sediment built up the soil that buried those rocks. So we sit up here on this hillside looking out, imagining we're still looking over that giant lake. You know, our, our house is beachfront property. It's just that the lake has been gone for 10,000 years. So when you look at the, the walls themselves, you also notice there aren't a lot of small rocks. And this tells you that up here, this would have been sheep pasture, uh, not croplands. And I would have done the same thing, you know, keep the crops down in our yard with that nice lake bottom sediment with the garden loves, right? And keep the sheep up here up in this sort of rocky, acidic soil where the pines grow and, and the partridge berries. And up here in these forests, you actually see that same pattern that we saw in our yard, which is that there are hemlocks all throughout the understory, but no hemlocks in the canopy. And this is, of course, the classic story of forest succession. When the sheep pasture was abandoned, the winged pine seeds flew out across the fields and they grew up straight and tall and pines love the sun, they grow fast in the sun, but the thing is they can't survive in the shade of their own canopy. 
Hemlocks, on the other hand, they love the shade and they're slow growing and they sit in the understory waiting, waiting for the pines to die, waiting to turn this into a hemlock forest. So all these layers in the forest, in the rocks, um, they, you know, they tell us about the past. Um, and, you know, there's this other, there's these cut stumps next to these, these uh, small birches that tell us about uh, in a couple of decades ago, someone cut some of the pines and left gaps in the canopy where, where the birches love to grow. So when you read these stories, you can learn about where the forest has been, where it's going, and you can learn about where to plant your garden and where to find the bobcats and fishers and partridge berries and the salamanders. And I think if decision makers had this sort of awareness of our landscape, we would make better decisions. And for me, it's just a really compelling and, and sort of inspirational way to connect with nature. So this is the this is the approach that course took and that I've turned into a book where we follow the students and we get to solve these puzzles and you get to solve these puzzles. And I'm really, really happy to be able to share this uh, with folks. And if we will My kids had to bury the phone off. at the end of the video just for fun. So in our front yard, you know, as you may expect, we, we take a wild approach to gardening. Uh, this is our neighbor's yard here. Uh, this is what our yard looked like when we moved in. This is what our yard looks like now. We mow sort of paths and, ma and mazes through the goldenrod for our kids to play in. There's uh, solitary bees that, that uh, nest in the dead hollow sumac stands. It's, it stems. It's just, a, it's just a mess there, you know, and we, we love that mess. It's got uh, fireflies and endangered snakes and bobcats and all and fishers and all sorts of things. And we don't break up the leaves and burn them and throw them in the dump because that's where the pollinators overwinter, right? We would be burning our pollinators if we raked up our leaves. We love all the little leaf miners that, that live in our plants. And we try not to plant uh, non-natives in, in neighborhoods where there are lots of non-natives planted. The, you know, Desiree Narango found that the, there weren't enough bugs because there are less bugs on non-native plants. And uh, the chickadees couldn't find enough bugs to feed their babies, so the babies starved to death in these neighborhoods. So in our yards, we control a whole world, right? And a classic example of this is in Phoenix, where you know it's a desert ecosystem, and some folks take this wild Zarek approach to landscaping, where they just let the desert run free. Some folks take use the Zarek plants, these desert plants, but they use take a very manicured approach to it. Some folks try to recreate Baltimore out in Phoenix and make something that looks like the East Coast with lots of water. And some folks actually don't have the resources to do much landscape and end up with these barren lots. And how you manage your yard, uh, Susanna Lerman found, affects what species show up in your yard, not just the plants, but the birds as well. So in those Zarek yards, you get uh, you know, curve-billed thrashers and roadrunners. In, in the other yards, you get pigeons and sparrows. And she found that people care. In these yards, these Zarek deserty yards, people love their birds. They talk about their birds. They're just so happy about the birds. In the other, these folks hate birds. They poop on things. They're loud. They just like complain about them. So there's all these rippling effects um, from what we do in our own little piece of the world that affect, come back and affect us and affect the whole world. You know, it, for one, one chapter of this book, I I went back to this university campus where I did my graduate work. And this, this campus here, it's, it's actually denser than Manhattan in terms of the number of people and you know students that live in this one small area. And in one corner of it, there is what we call the orchard. It's an abandoned orchard. And it's just a mess. It's just a tangle of noxious, horrible, invasive species, you know, multiflor rose, privet, bittersweet, all the things we hate, right? And uh, the whole uh, winter, I was going back to the orchard to try to get a picture of all the animals that live there for the book. And uh, that whole winter, there was this massive cleanup effort going on, trying to cut out these invasives, get rid of the bittersweet. And I wondered this whole winter if I was the only one whose heart kind of broke watching this cleanup effort. You know, because the orchard is a place that I have a deep history with. Um, for 11 winters in a row, my friend Charlie and I taught this winter tracking course, and we would uh, go all over Western Massachusetts, but we'd always start day one in the orchard for one particular species. When we get to the orchard, you notice there's this thicket of what we call rabbitat, which is um, these multiflora rose uh, thickets that the eastern cottontails love. And eastern cottontails, they're and sort of an imported species around here. They're not native, but you know they, they're in there eating all the, all the stems and 
above them the fruits of the of the rows give uh, uh feed the birds right the the robins and flocks of birds that overwinter with all these berries of the invasives that the birds are eating and pooping out. And I remember one time, Charlie, we were teaching this tracking course and Charlie was there telling about uh, bird language. And this is this idea that if you li listen to the birds, they'll tell you what's going on out in nature. And so as he was talking, like the robins, there was a cacophony of chattering and just sort of loud noise of all the birds and throughout this whole place. And then all of a sudden it went quiet. This hush fell over the orchard. And we waited. And a moment later, a cooper's hawk comes gliding low over the orchard. And we're like, aha, that's what the birds were saying. So this, this tangle, it feeds the little birds, these berries, and it feeds the little bunnies. And these feed the bigger predator, predatory birds, predatory mammals, the things that, that I was after when I was going to the orchard. So on, on Christmas day, it snowed pretty deep. And I went out with my five-year-old and we were walking to you know, go check our wildlife cameras. And you know the snow was so deep for his little legs, he couldn't quite make it through it. So I was walking in front of him and he was sort of stepping in my track so that he could make it. And, you know, the way coyotes do when they, they'll step their front tracks and then their back feet go in their front tracks. And actually they'll, a, a line of coyotes will step in each other's tracks to save energy. And so my son Juno looks up to me, me and says, Dada, you and me, we're coyotes. And I said, yeah. So we get up to the camera and, uh, you know, I, I throw my laptop down in the snow and pop the SD card out of the camera to check what, what pictures we have. And we expect to see a picture of us, me and Juno, walking up to the camera. And uh, so we look at the image and we don't see a picture of us. What we see is this. We see a coyote. That's all we see. And on some level, we believe that we transformed into this coyote. And we howled the whole way back to the car. So coyotes, they're a cool species. They're also a modern invention, right? Eastern coyotes, they didn't exist 100 years ago. They, they're Western coyotes that moved east and interbred with wolves and dogs and, and became a new thing. We found in the orchard red foxes, also imported for fox hunting largely around here, and gray fox, which are a fully native species. You know, when Charlie and I were teaching this tracking class, we would spend a lot of time out in the deep woods of Western Mass by the, the Quabbin and, and other areas. And every once in a while, out in those deep woods, we'd come across the trail of a bobcat. And we'd say, let's get on that trail and let's follow it. And we follow it with the class. And inevitably, it would take us to some horrible thicket, some abandoned beaver meadow or a recent logging cut, somewhere overgrown and tangled where the bobcats could hunt lots of bunnies. It would be someplace like the orchard. And it's bobcats. Bobcats are the reason that we always start in the orchard because it's the one place we can always go and always consistently find bobcat sign. Nowhere else we've ever seen as dense a population of bobcats as in the orchard. And maybe there aren't really a lot of different individual bobcats. It may just be that one family we've been following for 20 years that you know have no reason to go anywhere else because they have everything that they need right there. They've got the cover, they've got the bunnies. Why go anywhere else? So over the decades, we've built this relationship with these individual cats that we've tracked in the orchard. So when I look at the orchard, you know, I don't see a mess. I see bobcats. You know, I take you a mile away from the orchard. Uh, there's this famous uh, salamander crossing place that out in the spring, the salamanders come out and, the, and they cross the road and actually put in tunnels here. And the community of people come out and they help the salamanders with these bucket brigades cross the road. The spotted salamanders, and it's this great community event, this connection between the kids and, and the wildlife. And you know, it's not like spotted salamanders are particularly rare. There's probably over 20,000 populations of them at least in the state of Massachusetts alone. Um, and as we're driving to this spot on that rainy night, we're probably squishing a lot of other amphibians with our tires on the way to that crossing. So it's not necessarily about saving the species, but well, what I see this as, as relationship building, as that individual child holding that individual salamander in her hands and building a relationship with that organism. And to me, that's, you know, what this is all about. It's about building relationships between us and individual organisms and places in nature. And that's what, you know, we did in that class that I love, this field naturalist class. That's what made it so powerful. Um, so we went 
throughout this one valley, telling the story of this valley through all the different places we visited. And I want to start, I want to pause here and give you a little bit of thinking time. Now, I know you're probably at home watching a recording, so we can't talk directly. Um, but if you look at this picture, I want to give you a few seconds to think about what pattern do you see here that warrants explaining? Think about what you see and what, what, what pattern do you see? And I'm going to add a little bit more information for it. So again, and you know, if you happen to be on Zoom, I don't think there are too many folks on. You could chat in the Q&A or something and I can see your answers. But if you're just at home on your couch, what is the pattern you see? And I'm going to point out now that there's this pattern between the dark green on the right and the light green on the left. The plants look really different, and that's a real difference. There are very different species on this slope compared to this slope. So that's the pattern that tells a story. So then the next question is, why? What sort of process might explain this story? So again, you can chat or you can just think up to yourself. You can pause the video and think for a moment. I'll give you a few seconds to think about what sorts of processes could cause this. I'm going to add a little more information, which is I'm going to switch the name these these species pictures to their names and some information about where they like to live. Keep thinking. What could cause this pattern? So I imagine many folks have probably come up with this idea of the aspect, the direction that the slope is facing based on the sun, right? And I think you probably know this, right? In the Northern Hemisphere, the sun is in the south all of the time, which means if you are a south facing slope, you're facing the sun. And that sun dries you out. It makes for a warm, dry environment. And if you're on the north facing slope, well, you're in the shade most of the time. So you get a cool, moist environment. So when you look at this, notice that here's the compass. Here's the north arrow. So that makes this the south facing slope. The sun would be up here over on the right, bearing down on here, drying out this slope. And when you look at the plants, see this species right here has the more, wait, this is the sunny side. Wait, hold on, did I have this? This one's the dry side, this is in the shade. Wait, shouldn't to have this backwards? If the sun is shining here, shouldn't this be the dry side? Something's wrong. This must not be the reason. There must be another explanation. The sun's explanation seems to be exactly backwards. So what else could be causing this pattern? I'm going to direct you down low. The soils at a site come from a couple different places. They come from weathered rocks, and they come from decomposed organic material. And up in these hills, you tend to have an erosional environment where, you know, soils wash away and your bedrock really starts to influence things more. And when you look at these rocks here, this one, I don't know if you recognize it, it kind of looks like concrete, a bunch of stuff stuck together. Um, and this is a conglomerate with all these little pieces in it. This one with these sharp angled edges, you may recognize as basalt. And basalt is cooled lava. So why is there basalt here? Well, you know how North America and it keeps bumping into things? But the last time it's, it's separated from Africa, as it was separating, there were all these stretch marks that started to form in the edge of the continent. And into these stretch marks, you know, the valleys opened up and lava bubbled up into these sort of seven, 800 foot deep lava lakes, and they cooled into basalt. And then some more sediment fell on top and then more rifting and more lava. So we had these layers of basalt and sediment and basalt and sediment through rock. And eventually, you know, these rifting valleys, one of them opened up and turned into the Atlantic Ocean, but not where we are. This rifting valley was aborted, right? The real rift that won was east of Boston and, and the rest of what we know as the Atlantic coast today. And these aborted rift valleys from North Carolina to Massachusetts and beyond sat there with these basalt formations. And 
they were originally laid down like this. Eventually, tectonics tilted them, and then they were weathered by you know, by water and other things. And it turns out that basalt is more resistant to weathering, and so it kind of like stuck up. And that's what made these mountains, these basalt formations. And what we're looking at here is a crack between the basalt layer and this arcosic conglomerate, this sort of sandstony layer here on the other side. And it just so happens the basalt gives a lot of magnesium and other nutrients to the soils, unlike the conglomerate. So these soils are really rich in nutrients. And usually I think about plants as kind of like those that like rich soils also tend to be associated with moist soils because lowlands are often often both moist and rich because you know water flows downhill and it takes the nutrients from the uplands and brings it to the lowlands when there's more water in the soils the plants are more able to access the nutrients uplands tend to be dry and acidic and poor but here we've actually decoupled these two things and it's not the moisture preferences that's driving where the plants live it's actually the richness preferences the need for nutrients that gives makes this side have all the rich loving species and this side have the sort of poorer species, even though their preferences for wet and dry are flipped. So this, you know, you're looking at this valley, these plants, they tell you the story of the rifting of the continents 200 million years ago. And, and that's the story of the valley in which all of our other sites occur that, you know, tells the whole story. They relate to each other and tell the story of the landscape. And we walk from site to site, seeing different patterns and seeing different forces from glaciers to waters to, you know, all sorts of different fires and, and, and human land use and things that, that create our landscape. And it's my hope that when we bring this kind of awareness into the world and into the minds of decision makers, we will no longer be making decisions from this perspective of what I like to call the sort of drywall forest. And we will now have that perspective of the real forest in making decisions. So I want to end with a little reading uh, from my book, a couple paragraphs. Um, you know, my book's about nature. It's also about life. And there's metaphors in here. And I hope you take away some of that. Um, this is the part of the book near the beginning when we're going up and about to find that place where the basalt and the arcos intersect. And I'm carrying my son Juno on my back on this hot morning. We're walking up the trail, but we decide to leave the trail because Following the trail is the easiest way to be lost. Sure, that trail might take us to a preordained destination faster, but we'll have no idea where we are when we get there. While we're on the trail, we lose track of what's around us and where we are in space, we are lost. We put our trust in the trail, seeding responsibility. We give up our awareness, our senses, our minds. Our interface with the landscape boils down to just two numbers, the total length of the trail and the distance we've traveled. Staring at the path a few feet in front of us, we are not fully engaged with the surrounding world. But step off that path and suddenly we have to look up, look at the shape of the land and decide how steeply we wanna climb. Look at the trees in the distance and pick a target to walk toward. Keep looking behind so that we'll recognize the forest when we encounter it from the other direction on our return trip. Study the shrub layer for gaps to duck through, following the occasional animal trails worn through the denser areas Use the network of deer paths when traversing steep slopes to gain level footing. Keep an eye out for poison ivy, rose thorns, and ticks waving their arms in hopes of catching a ride. Study the patterns of light for clearings. Monitor the changing habitats near and far white tops of a sycamore in distance signaling a creek. Chestnut oaks nearby telling us we've reached the drier hilltops. The banjo-like bunk of a lone green frog calling from the wetland ahead that we hope to steer around. Keep an eye on the rising sun and remember where south is as we walk. This whole time, we maintain a map of the landscapes in our heads, filling in the details as we go. That is how we get to know the world and our place in it. So thank you, and uh, I look forward to the rest of the talks. Thank you so much. No, that was fantastic. That was really great. Um, next up, uh, please um, uh, welcome uh, Claudia and uh, One River. And welcome, Claudia. Hello, good morning, everyone. Thank you. Noah, thank you for that wonderful presentation. I teach myself a class on trees um, from a poet's point of view. Uh, my name is Claudia Castroluna, and I live in Washington State, and I am a poet. 
Um, I'm the former Washington State Poet Laureate, and today I will be reading poetry. Um, I was very inspired by, by Noah's presentation on uh, ways of reading landscape. The poem I'm going to read to you is, in a way, um, a, a path of discovery uh, that um, I underwent as I traveled the length of the Columbia River in Washington uh, State. Uh, when I served as the Poet Laureate of Washington State, I received a fellowship from the Academy of American Poets. I made a proposal. Um, poets, poets Laureate around the country were invited to uh, make proposals, and mine was one of 13 that was recognized and honored. And uh, my project consisted of tracing the length of the Columbia River as it moves through Washington state. The Columbia, um, the headwaters of the Columbia are in Canada and a third of the river traverses Canadian territory before entering Washington state. And once it does, it bifurcates the state um, in, a, in a straight line, essentially cuts the state of Washington in half until um, it meets the Snake River uh, which is coming from Idaho, and the two combined and become what is known as the Columbia Gorge, which is the dividing line, the border between Oregon and Washington state. And so my aim was to begin at that moment when the river enters uh, the state and to follow it until its mouth when it meets the ocean. And I propose to hold a series of poetry convenings at different spots along the river um, to bring poetry to parts of the, the Columbia, um, almost all of it really in central Washington state are very, very rural and agricultural. And um, my idea was to move along these communities and write and read poetry and build community. Um, from from sharing our experiences and sharing sharing the power and beauty of poetry. Um, my original thought was really to think about an encounter and open up space and lift voices of those people who live and work along the Columbia. There are um, Indian reservations along the Columbia. These are people who for millennia lived on the river and now um, are have been moved to these spaces, uh, sometimes river adjacent, sometimes not necessarily, um, and to commute with them. And also with a huge swath of the population in the state who are responsible for our, um, for the harvesting and the growing of apples, which is a billion dollar industry in the state. These are mostly immigrant um, workers and uh, immigrant families who do this work. And I wanted to learn from them. And like I said, center their voices with this project. What I didn't know then, because that was my proposal, is that um, something would happen inside of me that was transformative for me as a poet. And that is that in my travels to the river, because I've been, I live in Seattle, I have to um, get over a mountain pass to go to the area where the river runs. Uh, and I never really, I, I live on the ocean, I'm in Seattle. So we're right on the sound. And I knew about the Columbia and I had been there, but not to the extent to which I got to engage with it. So uh, in, my, in my travels, I learned how little I knew about this river. And I started my, my impetus, my thrust was to work with the human communities along the river. So the human ecology of the river. And I ended up being um, enchanted perhaps is, is, is not necessarily the, the correct word here but it aims in the direction of uh, being completely enthralled by the ecology of the river itself. 
And though I didn't um, intend to at the beginning, at the onset of the proposal, I ended up writing a book about the Columbia River. Um, this is a poetry book, and it is um, what I would like to share with you this morning. It's a it's a poem. Uh, it's one long poem that became a book. And uh, before we do that, I want to show you some photographs of the river. Um, and let's see here so that you could see, uh, have a sense of the scope of, um, of what this river looks like because it is magnificent. So here's the river at Kettle Falls. This is about 22 miles south of the Canadian border. For some reason, I thought that when I encountered the river up in its, you know, at the at the frontier with with Canada, that the river would be small. I don't know why I thought this. This was the first time I was that far up north in that part of the state, and as you could see, it is an enormous, magnificent river. Um, and this is before many many other rivers um, and brooks. And, and waterways have joined it as it makes its way to meet the Snake River to become the Columbia River Gorge. So, oh, sorry, let's, I got ahead. Here is, um, I'm on a, a small rise on a hill and it took me a while to figure out what I was seeing, but on the right-hand side, you see the Columbia coming down from Kettle Falls, the previous photo. And on the left, you see the Spokane River joining it. So this is the confluence of the two rivers. And in my travels, I ended up um, really sitting with these moments of confluence uh, between um, the tributaries of the Columbia. So here's the river farther south. This is at a schoolyard. Um, essentially, where the tree is, is the limits of two schools in Brewster. The elementary school, there's a, a small uh, playground. So the children there are looking at this as they are playing and coming to school every day. And you see the river, um, it's a cloudy day. Uh, I asked the kids as part of our poetry writing along the schools, what color was the river? Um, and at this particular location, some of the students said the river was pink and this was not a metaphor. I asked them to, to tell me more. And they said that in the morning when a layer of mist uh, hovers over the Columbia and the sun rises, the effect is to turn that layer into this pinkish color. So you see a pink snake uh, moving and hovering along the river as it flows onward, which is a really magical image. This is the point. I'm here at Pateros. I'm essentially standing on a platform uh, from where the, my, if I took one more step, my feet would have been on the in the river here. But you see, again, another confluence this time, the Twisp and the Columbia. The Columbia is coming in from the left and the Twisp is joining it on the right. And I had a moment here um, and you, and I'm, narrating this because you'll hear it in the poem, um, where for some reason I thought that these moments of confluence were going to be uh, turbulent enterprises, that there were gonna be turbulent moments of one river coming in into the other, and that I was going to see rumbling or waves or something that indicated this merging of two huge bodies of water. The Twisp is a really fast river, it's coming from the mountains is narrow and fast. And here you could never you would never know um, looking at the at the peacefulness of this photograph that it was uh, that the twist was such a you know uh, a speedy a speedy river. It blends, it gives itself into the Columbia and in this peaceful way. Of course, the Columbia is huge and so it's able to absorb this water. But just this, the peacefulness of, of this scene really struck me. 
here is the confluence of the Wenatchee and the Columbia River. Wenatchee is, is names itself the apple capital of the world. Um, and you see all those dry hills behind it. There are hundreds of orchards, highly productive orchards, um, all along the uh, Columbia River and its tributaries. And here on a fall day, the, the, I'm facing the Wenatchee River as it's coming in to meet the Columbia. There in that, at that moment, I uh, across the way from where I was is this park. And I have this photograph here because it's a well-known sculpture of coyote leading the salmon up the river. And it's a very whimsical um, sculpture that captures this Native American uh, story. Here is farther down south, the Matawa. At Matawa, the Columbia, there's a lot of birds here this afternoon. I had finished um, giving, uh, I had spent some time at Matawa High School at the schools there. Matawa is a very small community. Again, like I said, very rural. And I went down to the river after school and captured this photograph. Um, this is the merger of the Snake River which in itself is an enormous river merging with the Columbia. And I took this on a very rainy morning uh, at, a, at a public park. There was nobody at the park. I mean, it was really pouring. Um, and I, it was a marvelous time to, to be there. There was no one else. And the, the broodiness of the sky lend this magical quality to this unbelievable moment of these two huge rivers joining and again the peacefulness of the water as the as the snake meets the columbia here is the columbia on its way actually to the to the previous photograph early early in the morning Um, now, this is off of the gorge. This Cedar Creek is a small creek, but I love this photograph because you could see the humidity and the wetness. Uh, you could see what we often think of the Pacific Northwest and its forests, that moss, all of the trees here were covered in that thick moss. And here, what you see is Portland and Washington and the, and the bridge that connects them, this is I-5, connecting Vancouver, Washington to Portland, Oregon um, on a winter day and the river then moving on to meet the ocean from there. This is a photograph of the book I'm going to read to you. It's a, um, this was a collaboration I, I did with a, with the Seattle School of Visual Concepts we hand printed a hundred copies of the river of this of this book, which is titled One River, A Thousand Voices. And this was all hand printed um, and drawn. And I'm holding a mock up here of what eventually became the fine print edition of the book. And I will show you in a minute uh, the um, offset edition of the book, which is now in its second printing. And this is uh, an image that um, sort of, I, I love this, this image is a, is a composite of different artists' contributions. And I like the boat in the middle of the river um, as, a, as just to indicate the scale, the human scale to this enormous, enormous river and um, the ecologies that it maintains. So with that, I want to show you, this is what the, this is what the um, fine print version of the book is here, which is what I showed the photograph of me standing. And this is the offset version of the book. Oh, okay. It's very small and it opens into a one long accordion, um, mimicking of course, the, the movement of the river, so when it unfolds, it's the it's a it's a river. It's the the idea behind the book was that it's it is a poem that mimics the flow of the river, but it's also a book that is an object. It's an object um, of art, and so as I'm reading, I will be moving through 
all the different folds of the accordion. And um, I would be, I think I will finish before uh, my time and we could, um, if there are any questions, I would welcome any questions about the process of writing it or just being on the Columbia itself. Um, so this is titled One River, A Thousand Voices. When world was clamshell and heaven and earth mirrored each other, the blue of one hue to the other, when mountains spit fire and lava and their igneous entrails scorched earth and suffocated heavens, back when time teethered on eternal night and lights brink augured the unbounded burgeoning imagination of life to come. Before Ponderosa and Hemlock sharpened their needles thus, and cedar learned to lengthen its scales when camas stained canyons endlessly cerulean blue and over vast prairies flowers surrender their yoke stained petals to wind's pool. All the while time braided itself into your vertigree flow. Nature's godly audacity sowed mountains, crushed boulders, injected into each new grain of sand, mineral traces from the milky river up in heaven, and into each sand and egg, elemental mooring, so that when grown, she would know to risk gill and gut on her return from ocean's depths to your sweet streams for the chance to choose death to ensure future. Ever before the first human pupils bent in marvel and awe at the rumble and lightning, grace and muscular rigging of your current, in this earliest time before humans came to call themselves in reference to you, river peoples and peoples of the river, fusing their being to your being, before the ancients taught first peoples what to call the things of the world and humans flourished along the length of you and learned to honor and guard forevermore your presence and memory. A four sage woman etched into stone stories of her people and sat beside a quiet pool along rocky shores, hearing something of herself in the music and gargle of your waters before human tongues called a place of roaring, sizzling falls, Shanitwu, and your majestic self names of reverence, even before brave men perched on wooden planks and snared leaping salmon on their improbable journey journey to spawning sites, before prayers of praise and gratitude, before songs of sorrow and joy, before words spoken and unspoken rained upon your current, when cadence and rhythm of dancing feet transmitted heart and spleen yearning and gratitude down to your silty floor, certainly Thousands of years before captains jostled and repeatedly sailed past your ocean frontier, then sank against your bars before a man called you Columbia, you had long been Nichiwana for millennia running unbounded, howling coiled within your current arias of summer suns and howls of countless wolf moons. Most Certainly, before your chilly current was with concrete penned and silenced, so that at your icy pulse, so that your icy pulse degenerated to tepid lakes, before plentiful, plentiful salmon runs came to live their splendor only in the memory of those who were to them witness and their descendants. And when men and women were such, not Indian men and not Indian women, a time before treaty and broken treaty had entered the lexicon of Salishan, Sahaptan, and Chinookan languages, before men who had lived by their own rules were forced from their lands, before all the befores, you, river, had already been called a thousand and one names, each name for every animal, creature, and vegetable spirit that ever breathed, mated, and died, that ever flowered or shed a spore, each tree, each flower, each bulb, fish, mammal, 
insect, bird, each calling you a name of her own, from large to small, from scaly to winged, from furred to feathered, each thing indebted to your grace, scree, huckleberry, sage, pine, camas, alder, poplar, maple, lupin, dare, bear, coyote, elk, quail, grouse, hawk, eagle, bat, fox, wren, warbler, butterfly, burbot, salmon, lamprey, sturgeon, sculpin, all the flora, all the fauna, calling to you in dreams of awakening and in sobering dreams of change and demise, each name in every dimension, perfect, iridescent, as a miracle of a fish scale, fragile, as dragonfly's wings, as tule reed, sturdy and resilient, as bitter root. Each diurnal and nocturnal creature, her features embodying her own melodious name for life, the owl who swoops to snatch in night's downy hush, the unsuspecting frog, trout whose rainbow swagger flares gainfully your waters. As we call out to them, they call out to you, woodpecker tribes, beaver bear bands, coneflower clumps, each living thing with her own ardent name on the hoof, on the scale, on the feather, on the fur, on the leaf, on the mud, on the beak, on the bark, on the one river, a thousand names, a thousand voices chanting river songs, singing songs of place, charting songs of belonging. Sage women and wise men sense these non-human nomenclatures at the margins of their knowing, but never possess them. For those names belong only to you, river, to your meandering ways, to the islands in your midst, to the channels of your delta, to the splendor of your gorge, to the rage of your falls, to the turbulence of your current, to the eternal, unpredictable, and to silence, to the language of time. O oh, river, impervious to human foibles, kinks and skill, to wolves' backbone and cunning, to salamanders' tremulous heart, to the rustling of poplar tree leaves, river, you against whom people and creatures harness survival and hope, what names do you call us? when wings at sunset fold and later when we surrender to night our eyes. For it is hubris to grant faith and dominion only to alphabet and sword. It is hubris not to consider that you who for millennia have run and pumped don't also have manner and fashion of your own. Just because your course was marked on the map as territory and a four-syllable name on you in post does not make your riverness conquerable. For all we know and think we know, human experience is pinhead to to the universe of your waters as mist from mountains rises at dawn and to dusk belong the spirits who tease lush lavender skies yours is the thingness and riverness of you oh great river Oh, giver of life, oh, keeper of time, then, then, as you shall again flow supreme, singular to your mission, that being your effulgent return, first to ocean, the great water, then to cloud, diaphanous water, then to rain and snow, shaped water, to return back down mountains, channeling rills over mossy hills, feeding rivulets, quietly resting for a moment in the swirl of a chilly eddy, hustling onto streams, eventually to your own mighty torque and rhythm whose thunderous physics bolt you forward through canyons, around bends, past floodplains, shaping plateaus and prairies to estuary and delta, finally to empty yourself unrelenting for the future. And that's the end of the poem. Um, the poem, as you heard, begins a long, long time ago. And as I traveled the Columbia and was each and every single time arrested by its majesty, I um, 
began to wonder what it was like before there were humans. And when the first humans came, who must have named it their own names, which to this day survive, um, then what moment there at Richland, uh, and I showed you a photograph of that particular place, I realized that if humans had named it so many names over millennia, then the other beings who also depend on its waters must also have their own names for it, names that we cannot know because we do not speak um, Salamander's language or Coyote's language, but certainly there is a communication um, and a relationship between them and the river. Um, and then of course the poem ponders all of the dams that have been imposed and constructed along the Columbia all the way up into Canadian territory um, and which have um, really destroyed the, um, the return of the salmon to the Columbia and um, which have been unable to regulate the waters of the Columbia so that they are warmer now. Um, and salmon have a very hard time surviving in the warmer waters. Um, and the book addresses that the salmon, which is so integral to the river um, and to the peoples who identify with it and to, so, to the survival of so many other species endangered because of uh, the damming of the river and the consequences. Um, because of that action. So at the end of the poem, I debated whether um, what, what the ending of this poem should be given these things, very serious and detrimental things that I've told you and stories that I've heard um, on my travels. But uh, the poem ends with the future because I believe that understanding uh, the interrelationships between ourselves and our waterways and our trees and mountains can help create spaces to conserve them and to ensure that there is a future for them and for us as well. Thank you so much. I don't know if there's time for questions. No, we're kind of right at the end there. So thank you so much. Both of you, that was a, just a fantastic uh, presentation from two different sides. Much appreciated. Uh, folks will get a chance to see that on the videos and send in stuff. So yes. again, thank you both of us. That was, uh, I was really glad I could experience them and have them here. So thank you.